Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello, my name is Maisel Mustafa, board member of the MIT Arab Alumni Association, a volunteer-run association that was established to connect MIT and the Arab world and create a space for alumni to collaborate. Welcome to our inaugural program of series of webinars featuring experts from various fields. Today, we are joined by some esteemed faculty and professionals who will shed some light on the impact of COVID on education and share the measures being taken by their institutions. The webinar will last for an hour. I will begin by introducing our speakers, followed by some questions for, for them to answer. Finally, we will close out with a Q&A session. Please write your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, noting that there will be no voice participation it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nafiz Da'a. Nafiz is the executive chairman of IDRAC and the CEO of the Queen Rania Foundation's London office, where he oversees the foundation's strategic partnerships and talent development. He also leads the foundation engagement with the education entrepreneurship sector across MENA and globally. Nafiz founded IDRAC.org, the largest Arabic online education portal that reaches almost 3.5 million learners across the MENA region. IDRAC's learners come from all across the region and include disadvantaged youth in Gaza, Syria, and Iraq. Next, we will have Dean Hani Asfur. He is the Dean of Dubai Institute of Design and Innovation. He's an MIT and Harvard trained architect with over 22 years of experience as a practicing architect, designer, and educator, having taught architecture and design in the US, Lebanon, and the UAE, Asfur was recently named one of the 45 most influential architects in MENA by Middle East Architect Magazine, where, where he also won the 2017 Award for Best Cultural Building. And finally, we will have Munira Rabai, a faculty member teaching design, history, and theory of architecture at Kuwait University's College of Architecture. She earned a Master's of Science of Architecture in the Aga Khan Program for Islamic Architecture at MIT and has professional experience in the field of architecture and design in Germany, United States, and Kuwait. We will begin with Nafiz. Nafiz, you've been a strong proponent of online education and its champion in the Middle East for the last 10 years. Meanwhile, the pandemic has brought to light the importance of distance learning. What are your thoughts on this? How does this position your institution and what challenges will be faced in the future? Uh, thank you so much, Mace. Um, thank you everybody who's uh, here with us today. As you said, Yanni, maybe um, one of the few silver linings from COVID-19 is it's you know, forced us uh, to explore different models uh, and modes of learning. Uh, working uh, and life in, in, in general. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I, I want to start with is, you know, what do we think this means going forward? And th I think there are a lot of lessons learned, but I'll probably focus or start with three. Uh, like you said, you know, we've been talking about the importance of online and distance learning for the region for some time now. And I think one of the things that COVID-19 has proved is that, you know, distance and online learning are going to be part and parcel of any modern education system going forward. It's no longer optional. Um, of course, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, after sort of inshallah this crisis is over that, you know, learning is all going to be online or virtual, but we're relatively confident that this is going to be part and parcel of any system and that there are going to be negatives and, and positives to that. I think, you know, if, if I'm an average student, uh, this probably means there are going to be no more snow days on a very, you know, uh, uh, just pedestrian level. Uh, if, if I'm a teacher or an instructor, it does mean that, you know, I probably need to spend more time uh, developing and mastering uh, some of these pedagogies and I need my institution to support me, uh, which brings me to uh, my next point. I think, you know, the transition from offline to online, uh, we need to be honest and say, you know, it hasn't been smooth for everybody. It, it's not been sort of a walk in the park. It hasn't been a piece of cake, whatever um, we want to call it. And I think that goes uh, to the fact that, you know, it's not just a simple copy paste. You can't just take whatever you were doing offline and suddenly just put it into a Zoom call. Uh, and I think, you know, almost every sort of Zoom call I've participated in, even internally as a team, we always, you know, have connectivity issues. We're always, you know, struggling and, and trying to do things. So imagine trying to do that when you're trying to um, teach a class of 30 uh, to, to 20 people, and then sometimes obviously uh, more in, in certain scenarios, I think uh, is going to be a 
become a lot more important to continue to support and invest in, in teacher training uh, and make sure that teachers are empowered uh, to take this forward. Uh, I think the last uh, part of this that that's very important is, you know, this crisis, like many other crises before, has not affected everybody the same way. Uh, unfortunately, like many other crises, you know, those that are already disadvantaged with the system have been further and, and more affected by this crisis. And I think that's something that's going to be very important for us to pay attention to. Um, this whole concept that's been talked about for some years now of, you know, universal basic internet, and just making sure that people have a basic, uh, have basic access to an internet connection to access basic services or essential services uh, like healthcare and education is going to become uh, much more discussed or at least some sort of emergency response mechanism uh, for that to happen. And I think, you know, maybe this allows me to segue um, into, you know, what has this meant for us as a drop? Uh, you know, we've been sort of proud to have been very actively involved with the Ministry of Education in supporting the development and launch of the DERSEC platform, which was Georgian's national response. And specifically here, I think, you know, one of the defining features for us with the, for the platform was working with different telecom providers in Jordan to make sure that the platform is uh, freely accessible and open uh, to any of their subscribers. So if you are, if you have an existing mobile connection in Jordan, making sure that you're not paying or incurring any data costs from continuing uh, your, your learning process. Um, taking a wider lens, I'd say, you know, beyond, you know, just the K-12 space. For us at the DROC, as you said, you know, we're a little over 3.5 million learners around there at this point. And uh, almost 700,000 of these learners have joined a DROC since the crisis started. So we've had, uh, almost a 400% increase uh, on sort of a monthly basis in terms of enrollments. And that's, you know, translated into um, other metrics as well, just, you know, talking about, you know, the, the size of the crisis, but most inspiring for us really is, you know, just seeing how much people in the region are uh, hungry and excited about content uh, that's, you know, customized and tailor-made for them in their language. And uh, that's directly addressing and focusing on uh, their daily uh, needs. Um, I, th I think I'll end here. I can talk a bit more about sort of what we've been doing at the in, in QRF, but I'll maybe better leave that to the to the Q and A. Thank uh, you. Uh, unless unless you want me to talk about the challenges now, but you, you let me know. Ian. I um, want to just make sure I'm not I rambling on. <laughs> I think if we want, we can move on to Dean Hani, and then maybe at uh, during the Q and A session, we can elaborate more about it and what you have been doing. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be moving to the United Arab Emirates with uh, Dean Hani. Um, Hani, you're working at an institution that has collaboration, human interaction, and physical attendance at the core of its function. Uh, can you please give us some insight into the institution and how your organization has been affected? Hani, you're on mute. It's one of the things you were talking about. <laughs> Uh, I prepared some slides, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'll walk you through them. I won't be long, I promise. They won't be boring, I promise. Also. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about what did the idea I do to answer your question, Mace. Thank you so much for hosting me. I'm very excited to be amongst uh, alumni and uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, basically, uh, DIDI was founded two years ago, 28. We're on our second year. And as many of you know, probably know, the MIT is one of our curriculum partners. We built the program closely with the MIT School of Architecture and Planning and with a new school in Parsons because uh, MIT doesn't have fashion. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> but anyway, so we went to Parsons to get the, uh, the program. You know, they are good universities. And uh, we are a school of design and innovation, not just design and not just innovation together. The key thing is, that is our hybrid approach to education. Our DNA is basically uh, made of three basic things that we teach all the students, which is learning to be designers through visual literacy, learning to be uh, to understand engineers through tech, technological fluency and understand business people through strategic proficiency. We combine all of them and we have the four C's in every course students learn how to conceptualize, how to communicate, how to craft, which is the art of making, and how to care, which is the sustainable and empathetic 
approach to humans and the planet. So everything we try to solve, it has to have a, a particular caring component. We offer four disciplines of design, product design, multimedia design, fashion design, and strategic design management. Uh, these are the four that we picked because these are the things that are missing in the MENA region, at least at a higher level and at the level that we think would be helpful to um, prepare the next generation. We actually did a lot of studies understanding the future of jobs, and we discovered that if students are actually able to combine two disciplines together, they'll be better prepared for the future. So after the first year, students have to pick two of our disciplines, and you will see that they get closer to the skills needed in the future. So I won't dwell into that. I'll just give you an idea. So we offer six different pathways for the students, which is the outer circle, which is a combination between things. We know as MIT graduates that innovation happens when you collaborate, and that's something nice. For us. Students from day one learn the power of collaboration and more importantly, blurring boundaries uh, between disciplines. Basically, they chuck out disciplines out the window. So no more silo thinking. Uh, this is a typical environment. Uh, the students are very hands-on and from day one, they learn about electronics and combining it with uh, design and combining it with strategic thinking. So here you can see a first year student uh, working with Arduino, working with laser cutting, working with hand tools, uh, et cetera. So it's a very much a hand, hands-on design approach. Uh, we, we have incredible results in the first two years. Um, I can show you later, but today I want to focus on Mesa's question. Um, I think, uh, I strongly believe that higher education is in, is in a crisis mode. And um, if you see my video, you can see here on my desk, I'm reading this MIT Press book about MOOCs, which is one of the future things that the COVID-19 quarantine actually accelerated. So now we are all going uh, to, to that. And Naf has talked about that as well. And so uh, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, we sat down as a team uh, online and we asked ourselves, after this is over, what did we do? And as we always are thinking in terms of the student, student-centric, we place the student in the middle and we talk to our students and we ask them, what do you want to do? What can we do as a school? What was interesting is that we discovered that there are three different pathways that the students Chose. And this was a surprise to me because I thought everyone wanted to contribute. Because wherever you go, everyone's doing hackathons and, and doing all sorts of things. And it was interesting that half the population of our students, we have 80 students, uh, basically said, you know what, I don't want to be disrupted. I'm already stressed. You know, I just want continuity. I just want to keep plugging away at what I was doing. And this is what you see on the left of the screen. This is the section A. Um, and then the second half basically said, you know what, I'm not inspired. What's the point of going to school if we can't help the others? So this is a historic moment. We need to be helping others. And the school is pretty much divided 50-50 and even the faculty took two different positions, which was very interesting. And that's why it's important to empathize and listen to your audience as, uh, as, you know, as design teaches us. And so we discovered two different pathways. And the third pathway, were those who were saying, we want to help the community, but not necessarily through the school. So that's why we have the three different pathways. So look at, let's look at the A section, which is on the left, upper left, A1. So uh, the students who wanted to see continuity were saying basically, I don't want to lose the work I've done so far in the semester. I don't want to be distracted by anything. I'm already distracted. And we need to approach the pandemic in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way. So this is very important. This to me was a beautiful lesson from the students and the faculty. So A1 is basically, let's continue what we're doing, continue working on our current projects to complete the curriculum as planned. We need to survive and we need to be resilient. At the same time, we don't know all the requirements that are required for us to do that, so let me stay focused. The second group said, well, of course, now we were studying remotely. So what we want is basically to learn the digital skills. Um, 
and, and basically we'll focus on the manual skills later when we go back to the lab. This was particularly essential in the fashion studios because you know they don't have the machines or uh, things like that. I'll explain on the right how we solved that problem. And then design by inhabiting was basically live through this moment through self-reflection and hopefully we'll have a better understanding of it, which leads to the fourth one is that there is a group actively collecting data, trying to understand what this pandemic really is because there's so much news and so much we don't know. Those are the wise ones who want to basically say, let's collect data so later we can do projects for the pandemic once we know what this is all about. We don't want to be doing a knee jerk type reaction. On the right, you have um, students who are saying, it just doesn't make sense to continue doing what we're doing. We can't you know, put our head in the sand. We need to come up with something. Helping others will motivate me. What's the point of doing design if we're not helping uh, others? Um, people felt uh, urgently that they needed to make changes. And so there are three initiatives on this part. The Agile Factory is converting a studio, a workshop, and a lecture and combining the students into, a, into projects that solve problems for the pandemic. They joined a hackathon to create shields. They uh, did uh, other activities uh, resolved around helping the health community uh, because we have a strong relationship with the medical school here. And the second thing is that we made our fab lab completely remotely accessible. So uh, we, have, we got permission from the Ministry of Education to have our fab lab assistants go uh, alternating days so they're never there at the same time. They run the machines, students have remote access to them, we installed cameras and students can watch their work. We made a deal with Kareem so we can deliver things and with Fetcher so we can deliver the products to the students uh, in the same day. And if they're overseas, of course, it takes more time. We have five students who went back to their homes. And then the last one is to take a project from their current project, from their current studio and change the program so it's related to COVID. So they come up with a solution that they want. So you have it happening at uh, different levels. And the community one is basically joining other task force, hackathons, or finding ways to help your committee, uh, your community. And at the bottom is the faculty commitment that our goal is not uh, to compromise the standard that we want to deliver, which is the MIT standard. We want to actually uh, deliver the learning outcomes that we set out to do. We keep the calendar as it is, and we also empathize with the students. We converted uh, voluntarily all the grades pass fail. So if students choose to make them pass fail, so no one's going to fail the semester. So that is the pressure off of them as long as they attended the classes. So that's basically our approach, Mason. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, now uh, we'll, I'll leave the questions for later. If you have any questions for Hani or for Nafis, please put them on. Um, I'll now move into, uh, we'll move to Kuwait with Munira. Munira, uh, Kuwait was always an avid believer in the power of education, but, but also trusts that if it, it should be done in classrooms. This is founded on the belief of a certain richness in face-to-face -face interaction and human collaboration. As such, not enough attention was placed on digitizing the education sector. What measures has your institution taken to bridge this gap and how is it being implemented in your field of architecture? Okay, thank you, Mace. Um, so I'm gonna show you a different side of the story where here in Kuwait, uh, the equation is a bit different. Um, the biggest, challenge we face right now is the recognition issue. Um, basically, our main issue is that online courses, online course certificates and trainings are not recognized by our governments. Um, and some employers also, they, they don't accept any sort of online training or online certificates, for example. Um, that's the biggest hurdle we're facing right now. And I work in a public university and the public university hosts around 40,000 students. Um, so it's a large number of students. And um, ever since the official announcement of public holiday due to COVID-19 by the Council of Ministers, um, we've been stalled. Um, our education has stopped. Unfortunately, um, we, have, um, we cannot teach online, although we have all the means. Um, 
we use the digital tools every day in our classroom. Um, but the that we can't teach because basically um, it's the lack of leadership. Um, the issue here is very clear. Um, the crisis here is a wake up call to our institution and to the whole governmental uh, structure. Um, it exposed the gaps and the missing, it exposed a lot of issues. And I think the biggest issue is a, the lack of leadership in the society or this, this framework, the governmental framework, and the lack of recognition of any online training um, format whatsoever. Um, I know it's different with your, uh, with you, Mace. I think you can talk more, maybe. You can help me with this uh, conversation here in Kuwait about the private sector. But with, with the public sector here, it's different. We, our client goes back to the government, so we have to abide by government laws. Now, knowing that other universities, for example, have already taught online, I think there are three main factors um, before we jump into this digitizing, into digitizing, digitizing the educational sector, I think there are three main factors we need that need to be present, um, speci specifically in Kuwait and Kuwait culture. Um, first, assuming that the technology is there, we have to assume that the students are willing to learn. Um, without the students' will, there's, there's no point in moving, right? Um, the second one is assuming the teachers are willing, to, willing and able to teach online. And lastly, assuming that the institutional and government is supportive. Um, I think this is the biggest, uh, the biggest issue here. Um, now, every day in our everyday classroom, we implement online tools. Uh, we use the Microsoft Teams. We use a lot of local, different local online platforms like MyU. Um, there's a lot of different ones available to our students, but these are used mostly for social, for the social side of it. Um, but we use a lot of the Microsoft team, Teams, the Google Suites, and the platforms are endless. So I don't think it's a technological issue in, in, in my case, in my experience. I think it's more of a, of a structural framework. Um, so I think the, the biggest challenge, again, um, with moving to distant learning is to really pressure, to pressure the, the, the government to regulate and approve this move to online learning. And with that, we have to understand that, you know, there are different aspects that we need to take into consideration. And I think for me as a, as a faculty member, um, it's very important to find the right balance, to find the right balance between synchronous and asynchronous methods of teaching, meaning um, how, you, how you deal with people online is completely different than face-to-face. -face. And we're actually doing right now some training courses through the university on how to deal with that jump. Um, but that's for general, however, in my case, you have to understand that, you know, you have to think about the type of class you'll be, you'll be teaching. Um, architecture schools are taught in a completely different way. Um, you have to understand the number of students you have. I have around uh, 30 to 40 students in my studio, uh, which is a pretty large number. Um, again, we are the only college of architecture here in Kuwait. So we have a, a high demand of students and the student faculty ratio is a bit different. Um, and then going back to uh, the nature of our field, uh, specifically the architectural studio, is something um, that really incorporates studio culture. And if people are not familiar with studio culture, um, it's the key driver for a, creat for a creative working environment. Um, it's a place where you know we create a space for all the students to collaborate and work together and support each other. Um, it's a space for encouragement, engagement, and support. And it's a different approach in terms of, for example, I can be working at home remotely on my project and I can come up with a solution, right? With a, with a project. But then if I'm in studio, I can come up with a completely different, um, much more enha like enhanced um, end result because, because of the physical interaction between all the students. And the learning, again, for me, I strongly believe in peer-to-peer -peer education interaction. Uh, especially again in the creative field, it's completely different. Um, you can learn all, all the technological or digital tools on your own, but when you're actually creatively thinking or design solving, it's a, it, it, you need to be around you know, different minds and think about the, the same challenges together. Um, the second issue we also faced here is the work-life balance. Um, suddenly we have parents who are now teachers 
um, have to take care of their kids. They're also working at home and they're doing all these Zoom calls all the time, but also trying to be teachers. Um, so it, it's something that happens because of this sudden jump into digitizing the educational sector. And I think in the future, we need to just, you know, realize that there are certain responsibilities and certain timeframes for each things. And how do you, how do you kind of um, evaluate these and how do you work with this balance? Uh, and then also comes the engagement. How do you engage students uh, in discussion? Um, a lot of our classrooms are debates and we uh, have a lot of back and forth and it becomes physical and you know it's emotional. So it really enhances their, their way of thinking. Um, but then if you move into online discussions, you see that there's a, there's a lack of engagement from the students themselves. And also regulation, how do you regulate student examination online? I, I mean, uh, I'd like to talk about that later with Nafis, maybe that would be more interesting. Um, but how do, you, how do you trust students or how do you, in a society where, you know, there's a lot of cheating, a lot of things happening, how do you regulate that when they're online and they're away and there's no um, proctor, basically? And again, when, if we do move to um, digitizing the educational sec sec sector, I think we have to really change um, our expectations. Um, I think we need to reframe the way we teach and especially with hands-on classes. So I teach a lot of first year students, uh, foundation students, where again, our, our, our approach, our educational approach in the university right now is a very traditional approach. First year is all hands-on, hands hand-drawing, hand-modeling. Um, they don't start to draw on the computer or use the computer until the second year. So how do we start to see that shift if we start to digitize, especially within the, the foundation years, right? Um, and, I, and I wonder what are other methodolog methodological approaches people have explored? And I think, Hani, maybe you can um, talk more about that later on. Um, especially with, you know, there's a lot of VR and, and AR and AI coming up and the technology is like, it's, it's, it's really expanding so fast. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities also that come when we move to the digitizing sector, uh, digitizing the educational sector. Um, I think the opportunities are endless because first now you, um, your learners can be anyone uh, regardless of their race, regardless of their gender, regardless of their class, you know, you start to open up um, education to all, which is fantastic. Um, but the only thing we have to consider is the access to technology. And not everyone has access to technology. So how do we go about um, dealing with that? And then also another great opportunity that comes with going online is we can do this, right? Where we can really reach to a wider audience from all around. I can imagine having our final reviews with, you know, Hani and Dubai, uh, people from MIT, people from New York and become all in one online platform, which is fantastic. And you can start to really expose your students to way bigger limits um, and become limitless basically. And I think the biggest opportunity that comes with digitizing education is what you talked about earlier. I mean, I'm an avid uh, believer in multidisciplinarity and I think it's a great, and once we move online, we can also start to really um, open up the discourse to not just within the field, but really start to collaborate across. Um, and there's a lot of, there are so many people doing it right now. I mean, DD and Bay are starting to do that, right? And uh, the MIT Media Lab starts to, uh, take this and really run with it. And you asked about the implementation of technology, right? Um, yeah, how do you implement, uh, how is it being implemented in your field of architecture? So the field of architecture is, uh, is currently dependent on digital tools and digital technologies um, from machine learning to fabric, fabrication technologies from artificial intelligence to big data. We have, I mean, every day we use 3D and CAD softwares, BIM softwares. Um, if people are not familiar with those, these are just computer aided design softwares and building information modeling softwares, which uh, kind of calculate a lot of things and help in the design process. Um, and also I can see the future of really incorporating uh, VR and virtual reality. And, you know, there's a lot of tools online that are available. Um, 
for example, the Microsoft HoloLens, which you start where you can just, you know, wear your glasses and you can start to basically what it does is it uses optics and sens sensors to deliver 3D holograms um, that are pinned to real world. So you can start to really use that as a guide to help with construction, you know, within the field itself, but also in education when you start to move into design build courses, right? How do you deal with that? So maybe incorporating VR and AR technologies can really push um, this degree of education. Um, and again, it's rare that an architectural project uh, not use any digital tools. We are, we're highly dependent on that. But again, we face a lot of issues with um, educate, education because in the field is different than, um, there's a big gap between the, the way architecture schools are being run and the way architecture practices are actually happening. Um, so I think there's the, this gap really needs to be, you know, uh, it needs to come together and start to realize, okay, how do we start to connect these using technology and perhaps, you know, moving online can actually help that. Um, and in conclusion, I think, again, uh, COVID-19 was really a, a wake up call. Right now, we, they've announced um, officially, March 1st was the official announcement of uh, the public holiday due, due to COVID. And then they announced that we will resume our education in August. So that means we are staying at home for five months. My students are staying at home for five months with no, absolutely no way of you know, continuing um, education with me. But I mean, I've constantly been in contact with them, sending them tutorials. There's so many things and so many resources online that you can really use. Um, so I've, for me as an instructor, I think it's a lost opportunity, uh, but it also um, allows you to understand that, you know, you don't really need the classroom to learn. There's a lot of opportunities happening online, but at the same time, again, we're talking about architecture here. And when we talk about architecture and the architectural education, it's the physicality of the space is essential to our learning because it is the medium of our, uh, uh, of our study, right? So I think, again, I don't think architect, and I, again, I keep talking about architecture education. I don't think we can solely relate, uh, move to the digitizing the educational sector in architecture. However, I think the physical, physicality of the space itself is very important. I mean, I can see a future where, let's say, um, uh, there are no campuses, but there are these decentralized labs, decentralized areas where you know people can start to access tools and 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 digital equipment that they don't have access to. Um, and finally, again, looking at the bright side, there's a lot of technology, but the biggest issue is investing in design education. Um, investing in design education is close to nothing uh, in, in here uh, in our region. Uh, I think DD is the first kind of design institute to actually come up and that only happened a few years ago. So that's something new and I wanna see how we can really, you know, have a strong leadership in funding and investing in design education. And I'll stop here and maybe we'll continue later in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Munira. We're gonna actually move to the Q&A now. Very interesting, three speakers that have a wide spectrum. We went from a complete online implementation uh, of education to a new uh, way to implement it online to another specter that is trying to digitize itself. Um, the first question comes and goes to Nafiz. Uh, what measures are being taken to reach marginalized communities uh, like refugees who don't have devices or connectivity? As you may know, the MENA region is a region that is not, uh, that doesn't have connectivity all the time. Hardware is very, is not available. So how has Iraq been actually dealing with these disparities? As you said, you reach communities in Gaza, Iraq, and Syria. So can you please answer that? You're on mute, Nafiz. <laughs> Technology. Uh, yeah, um, uh, thank you uh, for that question. I mean, I think so pre-COVID, you know, we, we've been conscious of that and, and we've talked about uh, that a lot. Um, we talk a lot about sort of, you know, the, the four C's of, you know, delivering education. You think about, you know, the cost, the connectivity, uh, the currency of the degree, and of course the content itself. And I think, you know, each one of these 
uh, aspects of, of, of the framework are really important when you're trying to reach, especially, you know, uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, for Iraq, especially, specifically, I'd say in the refugee camp, we've always delivered through partners. Um, so whenever we've delivered content, it's actually really been championed by, you know, great people like the Norwegian Refugee Council, UNHCR, uh, CARE and others that have del delivered the content in camps. And they usually supplement it with, you know, the needed uh, access to uh, devices and uh, internet. And I'd say, you know, the, the four camps, I think that's incredibly important. And um, one aspect that I would say is important to highlight here is just being connected to the internet does not mean you can learn online. Uh, I'd say, you know, we've learned that the hard way, uh, especially, especially in, you know, vulnerable populations. We've seen, you know, people have a smartphone, they're connected to Facebook, they use WhatsApp, but really, uh, and sometimes I'd say, unfortunately, that is the extent of the internet to them. You know, it's, it's effectively owned by uh, Facebook or uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, which is, again, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it means, you know, they really need the digital literacy to move beyond that. How do they use an email? How do they uh, search uh, on, on different platforms and learn online? And I think that part of the connectivity aspect is important. Um, obviously, I mean, there are other examples, you know, beyond the rock and uh, outside of uh, Jordan and the region. Uh, the Teaching Without Internet Alliance has, you know, put a lot of content out there specifically for these populations. They recently put out a paper on that, and I'd be happy to, to sort of share the paper with, with anybody uh, that's interesting, specifically discusses, you know, how do you work in, in, in areas where there's little to no internet in terms of distributing uh, teaching packets, uh, uh, paper packets, and uh, other tools. Thank you very much, Nafiz. And just as a follow-up to that, have you seen those? Uh, have you have you applied these to any elementary or in secondary education? Sure, sure. So I mean, so uh, Idrak, most of the content on Idrak, I'd say, when Idrak was founded, was really focused on higher education. Uh, but working with partners like the Jack Ma Foundation and others, you know, we've expanded our content library to include. Uh, content and curriculum for K to 12, specifically in math and English for now. That's aligned with the national curricula of Egypt, Jordan, uh, and Syria. Um, I, that's relatively been sort of very successful. It's been, I'd say, one of our biggest contributions to Dersek as a platform uh, here in Jordan, but also across the region. Uh, it does become harder though, I'd say, you know, for younger uh, age populations, once, once you want to implement technology, you know, you need to make sure that you involve uh, parents appropriately and that they have the right scaffolding to support uh, their children through that. Thank you very much, Nafiz. Our next one goes to Hani. Um, Hani, uh, do you have any collaboration with MIT now, um, COVID related? Please unmute. <laughs> We're having trouble with that today. Honey. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. No, we don't. We don't have. Uh, we we were planning a IAP program with MIT uh, over the winter break, and another one in the summer. Um, uh, but with COVID, no, we haven't had anything. Although. Uh, you know, Hashem Serkis and I are in touch, but we 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 haven't been able uh, to do it. Okay, and well, another we have with local universities, we have a couple with local universities. So if that helps, yeah. Okay, another one is the DD framework is quite impressive and proactive. Uh, is it more of a short term approach, or is it sustainable in the medium and long term? Uh, I don't know, Faris, do you, thank you for the question. Uh, great to see you here. Uh, the, is the question for the uh, framework in general or is it the framework that we're using with COVID? Uh, I think if it's general. So for, in general, uh, is it sustainable? Yeah, sustainable and scalable. Now we're considering adding uh, one more uh, discipline. So then the output would be 10 possible. Uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, combinations. Um, is it sustainable in the sense uh, it is evolving? For instance, multimedia is we're going to shift it towards more AI from now on and away from graphic design and that because we're seeing a lot of growth in AI and uh, there's a lot of interest. Um, and uh, fashion, we're going into sustainable fashion. Uh, which is from the beginning has been the, the case. Uh, and then we're considering, so it's, it's, it's uh, I, I won't go into all the details, 
but it's really actually uh, very flexible because there are components that you can move around. The, the thing is though, we can't change anything before our fifth year. We're only in our second year because we need to get re-accredited based on what we offered and we cannot change anything. That's one of the constraints that drives me crazy because I really want this to evolve faster, but we have to be respectful of the process. And if we talk about your uh, COVID framework, is that yeah. sustainable? Uh, ask me in two weeks. We were still assessing it. We'll be done with the semester in two weeks. Then we're going to do a proper uh, assessment. Uh, as we were doing it, there were complaints that, you know, it was imbalanced and, we, you know, we, people are never completely satisfied. At the same time, we're receiving great feedback. We're collecting all the feedback. And then in two weeks, I'll have a more informed answer. But so far, it's been terrific. We entered the hackathon. We were finalists, the students. So that was exciting for them. We didn't win, but they, they made it that far. And that was exciting. Thank you. That's a great answer. Hopefully it works out and it becomes yeah, sustainable. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, this is a question for all three of you. And feel free to jump in. Um, students and institutions have different goals. How does social distance address these different objective, objectives, example, credentials and information versus instilling values and, atti and uh, attitudes? Who would like to answer that? So basically, it's talking about the difference in values between students and their institutions. Institutions have values and strategic objectives and things they want to instill in their students, whereas uh, students have their own beliefs and their own um, objectives of learning, and that's why they go to a certain institution and not the other. So uh, uh, how does social distancing address these different issues? Uh, let, yeah, go, ahead, go ahead. No, no, please. Uh, <laughs> you're a dean of an institution, so you probably have a, a more valuable perspective no, on what will happen to no, go I, after. I just have a, an anecdote from today's uh, faculty meeting. Um, if we were, uh, because we were sharing, we did advisement online with the students and uh, a lot of them confided to their advisors that if we continue next semester in quarantine, they're going to take a year off. So a, a majority of students don't want to continue this way. A lot of them miss the university. And as Munira was talking, we're a design school, this, this open uh, collaboration, seeing, learning by looking, learning by listening, receiving feedback from your peers, that's very important. So if the majority of students want to take a year off, if we continue in this way, it's, it's a crisis for us. We have to think about how, how to do it. Um, so the most important thing to answer the question is to keep listening and being sincerely student-centered. Uh, we listen to the students, we talk to them. It's not pampering or giving them what they want. We're literally listening to what they are saying and literally reacting. We are still small, we are still agile. We're only nine faculty members, so we can easily adapt and uh, understand. And this is something I want us to keep as we scale. This is one of my big challenges. So it's very important to be adapt adaptive and responsible to the students and get those goals aligned. Nafis, do you want to answer that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to give a comprehensive answer because, you know, as uh, Dr. Hani alluded, you know, different people have... Uh, uh, different uh, goals and different institutions provide uh, you sort of a pathway to sort of a different goal as well. But I will say, you know, one of the things that COVID-19 has definitely done, I'd say, is maybe expose uh, some of those gaps and, you know, by exposing them, help us to better align and understand them. That, you know, really differs also per what segment or, or sector of the education system you're talking about. So I think, you know, one of the things our region suffers from quite a bit is, you know, rote learning and memorization, maybe specifically at the K-12 level. It is almost impossible uh, to get uh, you know a, a fifth grader to do something you don't want them to do if they're uh, if they're not sitting with you in the same classroom uh, and I think you know we've all you know had quite uh, even maybe as a student, so you ask, why am I learning this? Why am I learning this? Just because it's on the exam. And once you transition online, you really need to start thinking about how do I make this uh, more meaningful, more relevant, uh, and just more obviously helpful to students in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think you know that uh, sort of fracture or sort of 
highlighting that you know fracture between you know uh, the goals and aims of students uh, and the education system is actually a good thing and, and it will push us in the right direction again it's not going to be overnight as uh, Dr. Hani said, you know, we need to continue listening to the students and adapting to them. I think maybe as a Ministry of Education in any Arab country, they're probably a lot less lean and responsive than uh, Didi, but uh, I think we're on the right path. As a follow-up, as a follow-up to what you just said, um, uh, sorry, Munir, do you want to say something regarding I that? I mean, there's also an opportunity here if you do move. Uh, to the, digitizing the educational sector, you can start to create those streams, right? I mean, then you can really filter the students who actually want to learn and those who are just, you know, being forced by society and um, family and all of that. So, I mean, there's an opportunity there to really create the, uh, the streams that you're talking about, uh, Dr. Hani, in your, in your institute, right? Where you can choose which path you want to take. And I think if you start to open up um, different platforms online you can start to see ex uh, students accelerating in those uh, versus being held back by other students or other so you can start to see acceleration you can start to work with you know uh, smart um faster learners and slower paced learners and you can start to divide them in this way where it's not too obvious when it's in the classroom so that's just yeah. what i wanted to add <laughs> as a follow-up to that do you feel that covid has helped uh, level the playing field between the edu on, like uh, regarding education globally or does it widen the disparities I, I, I mean I would say it definitely widens the disparity unfortunately I mean I think you know between resource rich and resource uh, poor areas you know as I said in my opening remarks I think you know um, like many crises it, it's the people that are already disadvantaged that, that get affected more and again you know um, you know being I mean you know we're all from you know uh, all, all the panelists you know Gone to MIT, or I went to maybe a lesser known institution. Uh, but, you know, I think we're all very privileged here. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to realize that you know, when, you, when you talk about most people uh, around the, you know, 1.3 billion learners uh, affected by this, uh, most of them don't have regular access to the internet. They're not going to a top tier academic institution in the US. Uh, I recently saw, you know, a report saying in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, connectivity in, in the schools is, you know, less than 20%. So you have 80% of people that have been majorly affected. So I'd say, yeah, no, definitely broaden the gap. And uh, do you feel, how can we tailor the online education to fit more towards the region, like the MENA region in the Arab world? Um, so, I mean, I, so on that, I'd say, so in investing more and more in connectivity is going to be very important. Uh, I think, you know, in, in places like Jordan uh, and maybe the GCC connectivity is, is relatively good. Uh, obviously, I think, you know, certain parts of, of Jordan, it, it needs to improve as, as, as well. Uh, but if, you know, if you go to um, the larger region, there's still some way to go in terms of connectivity to the internet. But again, that's definitely improving. Uh, the second thing I think is really, you know, uh, no education system, whether online or offline, is going to be better than the quality of its teachers. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, that's one thing that we strongly believe in across the entire, you know, Queen Rania Foundation portfolio. Uh, and, you know, through the Queen Rania Teachers Academy, we've invested quite a bit in. So I think, you know, training teachers, enabling them uh, and empowering them to teach online and use these digital tools is very important. Uh, because at the end of the day, I think, you know, the tools can be, you know, replaced, they can change, but the teacher will remain, you know, central and, and a big part of this process, even with, you know, any of developments in, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. And I would say, and I'd end on, you know, if anything, the COVID crisis has even made it more important uh, or, or shown just how important that relationship between teacher and student is uh, to overcome this crisis. And it's, you know, teachers that have invested in building strong relationships with their uh, students are the ones that have been able to uh, help them get through this because obviously, you know, this has been a uh, mentally and uh, you know, on, on multiple levels difficult time for a lot of households. Um, thank you, Nafiz. Um, Hani. Uh, there, there, there's a question that says, given that MOOC classes are quite different from presential ones, what do you recommend to make them more effective and motivating? Hmm. Uh, the, 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 beautiful, uh, the beautiful thing about having to learn suddenly how to use uh, online learning, and I speak from experience, is actually doing multimodal teaching. And uh, we, we introduced a lot of tools like, I, I don't want to advertise them, but like Menti or uh, Miro or other different tools online. 
And the feedback of the students was terrific because they want more activities like that because then they stay uh, attentive. Now, all of our courses are visual. So uh, it's not, you know, someone droning on and talking without visuals and et cetera. So uh, what we've learned is that we, we knew this already, but we needed to change our mode of learning. Now we were forced to do it, which is to teach them in little chunks and do uh, exercises to reinforce the learning. And uh, this, is, uh, this is common in online learning. I mean, uh, if you know, uh, you know, Harvard X or MIT also, their courses are done in that way. So we need to restructure our information and uh, not tone it down, just restructure it, find a different way to keep them engaged. Imagine you're watching a video for an hour and a half. No one does that anymore unless it's entertainment, right? For educational, you need to do check-ins to keep them engaged. So I would say we have a lot to learn. Very good, thank you. And there's a question from Munira um, there that says, what happened to the, uh, to the project Diana, free MIT online content? Could that be useful to bypass the lack of approved, approved online courses in Kuwait? Yes, I mean, I've given uh, my students access to, I mean, they're all free and they're accessible to everyone. So I've given them these specific resources and uh, the EdTech uh, edX um, has a great variety and the Harvard uh, GSD also the MIT uh, d uh, courses are also all available online. So I've sent them all of these resources. It doesn't, um, it gives them access to these resources again, as I said, they can access a lot of different information, but how do they apply them is something that they have to do on their own, unless they come to me, which I'm, I would love to, but again, it needs the willingness of the student to actually, you know, take that initiative. So. Thank you. Hopefully there'll be more appealing the online courses and they'll be more engaged with them. Um, there is a question that's to all three of you. How do you think each of your institutions would change its pedagog pedagogical approach post pandemic? And how will your personal teaching approach change? Yeah, I mean, I, anyway, I just answered that, that we, we really need to accelerate the learning. We were learning at the same time. Now we have accelerated that learning. Um, definitely um, how how the, the biggest challenge, which is what um, Munira uh, focused on, is how do you teach hands-on learning and how do you teach collaborative learning um, online? And I think there are tools that are helping. I think Miro is a very good tool if you haven't used it for uh, collaborative co-creation, uh, but it's not for 3D printing or uh, objects, it's more two-dimensional post-its. So, um, we have professors who want to create their own tools. So we will see what will happen, but it's really giving us an opportunity here, I think. Uh, a follow-up to that would be, do you think that forced digital transformation will help bring more recognition to online degrees? Huh. It depends. <laughs> um, I mean, again, for us, it's if you start to really push and pressure the government and show the value and show them, I mean, maybe it can, it has to come down to money, right? Maybe you can show them like, you know, if you start to do this, you'll cut costs, you'll do this. It's better for everyone. Then people will accept it. So I don't know if it's if force is the right um, term to be used, but I think definitely the pressure needs to happen. And again, with the pressure comes a lot of different things, regulation, balance and engagement and all of that. And, um, and what are concrete measures uh, to protect the privacy of the students with all this digitalization? Nafiz, maybe you can ask that. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, so Idrak is GDPR compliant. Uh, we obviously, uh, I guess, you know, through our platform, uh, serve a lot of Syrian refugees in Germany uh, and sort of across Europe. So we are GDPR compliant. I think, you know, that's, um, in an, an extensive framework. I mean, I'd say maybe in, in certain quarters, certainly in the US, maybe people would argue it's excessive. Uh, but I think, you know, the frameworks out there, you know, protecting people's identity, only making sure, you know, um, you collect only the necessary information, being very sensitive about, you know, how you go about educating children under the age uh, of 18. I mean, we, uh, 
do our best to, to and obviously comply with all of that. I think it, it gets again much much more difficult when it comes to uh, younger students and especially students in in, in school. Uh, but again, uh, the frameworks are all out there. There is uh, more and more I'd say talk now about you know how to use you know uh, the blockchain uh, to uh, help people you know potentially uh, record. Um, their sort of credentials and then take them with them and potentially, you know, um, own them. I'm not an expert in sort of that area, but, but I'm sure a lot will happen in that uh, sense as well. Thank you very much. The last question is how, what about assessment? Um, how do you think assessment of students will vary with all of this uh, digitalization? Um, sure. I mean, I think um, so. One mistake that you know a lot of people make is, is falling in love with technology for the sake of technology. At the end of the day, it's really about uh, the learning objectives you have for your classroom, and then you know, uh, based on those learning objectives and outcomes, uh, what kind of skills are you you're trying to assess? Um, I think you know there are a lot of tools. Uh, out there, so in terms of proctoring, you know, virtual and digital proctoring uh, is an option. That there are quite a few companies uh, that do this for you if you want people to to, to proctor students while uh, they're taking an exam, and there are also different kinds of proctoring. Uh, in general, I'd say one of the things that online learning has uh, made popular again, especially at you know a large scale, is is peer to peer assessment and and peer learning, which actually ends up having you know quite a bit of. Uh, benefit in terms of achieving certain educational objective. So I'd say, I mean, it's, it's really about, you know, what you're trying to assess, certainly, and I think you know, there's no way of denying this, uh, subjects that are more quantitative, so the hard sciences are probably easier to assess online right now, but that's not to say there aren't more and more tools to assess, you know, creativity, collaboration, and uh, other areas. Yeah, in our case, we've done, we're doing the juries online, so students present their digital work. And we, we get uh, the jury to sit together uh, and we can all see them on Zoom like we are seeing each other. So it works pretty well. Uh, we don't have any uh, closed book uh, exams uh, uh, at DITI. It's one of our policies. So they have a take home exam in the history course, which they take home, it takes three weeks uh, to do it. They can collaborate, it's open book, et cetera. But it, we're looking for the critical thinking skills. So, uh, of course, if they cheated, uh, we, we have the tools for plagiarism. Um, and you can tell, I mean, we know the students, so we know if they are. But it's really when you encourage them and you empower them, they're not going to cheat. When they realize they don't have to memorize and spit it out, they're not going to cheat because you keep reminding them we're looking for your own ideas. Um, and uh, basically, that's how we're doing it. Uh, the ministry asked us, how are you monitoring uh, uh, those exams? And we put not applicable. It was quite funny. We, they haven't replied yet, but I'm waiting for them to, to reply with a query. Very, very creative. <laughs> <laughs> I think, again, um, sorry, you have to change your learning objectives. Uh, if you're moving to a different platform, you have to expect different things. And again, as uh, Dr. Hani mentioned, um, we have to also rework how we assess. Um, in today's age, history, you don't need to memorize, right? Memorization is not a, something that you need to do anymore. Uh, you can just take your iPhone and just check for any date, right? So, I mean, our examination is even necessary at this time of age. So really moving into critical thinking rather than um, uh, memorization and delivering what you know people have hammered into your brain. Thank you so much, Munira. And sorry for all the questions we haven't answered. We're running out of time. And uh, thank you, Hani. Thank you, Naf thank Nafis you, from London and Dubai. Thank you, Munira. It was a pleasure hosting this with all of you from all of us at MIT AAA. Um, stay safe. Goodbye. And thank you for joining us. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.